What's up YouTube? Today we are going to show how to contour all of the head and neck OARs in less than 10 minutes. This is an ambitious feat, but let's get started. So, it's always intimidating when you have a head and neck case come in, so sometimes it's nice to just start with the simple. We'll begin with the lungs. I'm going to do a region grow here. I'm looking at my sagittal and coronal to make sure I'm in the right box. And then we will do a contralateral lung. Lung is important to contour if you're getting down into the level four lymph nodes for your involved or elective nodal CTVs. So you can calculate an accurate mean lung dose distribution. For this reason, we scan down to the diaphragm, as you can see in this image, and not just to the top of the lungs. Once we feel pretty good about our lung contours, I like to start down and go up on the spinal cord. So the spinal cord can begin down here. I like to use maybe an eight millimeter brush. And you can contour every couple of slices because you're gonna be interpolating this at the end. You can't see exactly where the spinal cord is because this isn't an MRI but you want to do your best to kind of guesstimate where it's most likely lying. And for the uncertainty, we include a spinal cord PRV, which is a five millimeter uniform expansion. And we actually have different dose constraints for the cord itself and for the PRV. And so we see here, we're getting towards brain and brain stem. So this is where I would do the last slice, and you can look here in the sagittal to kind of see where we're at. So I will interpolate, and now expand five millimeters to get the spinal cord, five VRV. And here we go. So I limit Dmax 45 in the middle, and then for the outer five millimeter ring, 50 gray Dmax. And I will use a caveat to everything I'm showing here. This is a brainstem is meant for educational purposes and there's no one perfect way to do contouring. Every patient is different and I don't think there's a single radiation oncologist that would contour two things exactly the same, but this is a safe way to contour. It's acceptable and no one would fault you for submitting these kinds of volumes. So we're getting the brainstem. It's easier to see once you're up here. And the question is, where am I going to stop contouring up? Do I just keep going up that, that? So actually, once you see this fissure here sort of representing the ventricles, that's, that's where you stop. So the slice right below it is going to be your last slice. And if you look closely, you can sort of see the outline of the brainstem there. Great, and I'm just going to fill in these slices in between. You have the characteristic two humps. Good, and now I'll interpolate. Quick sanity check, scroll down, to make sure everything looks okay. And now since I'm in the brain, what we do, this is optional, but we have the area post rima, which is right here, anterior to our fourth ventricle. This is a chemo center for our brain. So very sensitive, it's chemo receptor. And avoiding it can help reduce the chance of experiencing nausea during treatment. Now we are in the brain. We're gonna do a region grow. This is MIM software. And I look at the bottom and I like to bring the bottom down to the bottom of my brain stem just to be consistent. Great. There's the brain, and now since we're up here, we will work our way down, starting with the eyes. So we'll begin with the right eye. And what I like to do is I like to make a sphere that's about the diameter of the eye, centered in the middle of the eye. So you go to the middle on the sagittal, coronal, and axial slices. Once you're there, you make the sphere about the diameter 
and thick. And now if I look at the sagittal, I can see I'm missing maybe just a few slices superiorly and inferiorly. So I'll just go up one, click this again, maybe one more, great. And similarly, go down one, looks pretty good. Actually, it looks very good. I'll scroll down just to make sure I'm not missing any slices. And it looks like there's just a little bit more here. And scroll superiorly to make sure I'm not missing any slices. Great, and now we'll do the same thing for the left eye. So I really recommend this trick using the sphere. Most eyes are shaped like a sphere with minor adjustments afterwards. So I make sure I'm in the middle, sagittal, coronal, and then click. Got a pretty good looking eye there. Extend it just a little in superiorly and just a little bit inferiorly. And now we'll see if there's any that's missing down here. Just a smidge. Great, so now we're gonna do the lenses. The lenses are pretty easy to see. You can see they're opaque, kind of look like bright little spots, usually two or three slices thick. This CT scan uses 2.5 millimeter slices. I think three millimeters is pretty standard. Remember when we're doing these head and neck regions, and slice CTs are helpful for making sure we're not missing any important parts of the head and neck anatomy. And I'll go ahead and counter this as well. Next up, we have the lacrimal glands. And so these are not always contoured by radiation oncologists, but I will say if you're doing a nasopharynx case or something in the scalp where you're pretty close to this or the eyelid, you definitely want to preserve lacrimal glands and they're located here laterally. You can see this sort of white brighter area here. So this is a lacrimal gland. Hard to delineate exactly, but what matters is including some sort of structure there just so that you can tell your planner to avoid hot dose in this area. Great, and we will move to the left lacrimal gland. So similarly, you can sort of have both sides visible for reference so you can get a sense, okay, my right one is there, maybe my left one starts here. And it's the space just lateral to the eye, to the orbit. Okay, we're making some good progress here. Now we're gonna do the optic nerves. The challenge here is being able to distinguish rectus muscle from optic nerve. You know it's optic nerve when you click and you can see that you're here, kind of mid-plane in the sagittal view. So I see that here, sort of confirmed, and you begin to trace what you see. Now scroll up one, and here the optic nerve will pass through the optic canal in order to enter the brain, and here it has entered. Optic nerve on the left, and now here it has entered. Here it's passing through the optic canal, and here is where it began. And the reason I like to draw this sort of to the point where it's entering the brain is because it's gonna connect to the optic chiasm. A lot of times you'll see the optic chiasm drawn as a little cross, of course, with a CT scan, it is very hard to tell what the optic chiasm is. If you have struggled to tell where an optic chiasm is on a CT scan, you are not alone. That is normal. It is very hard, if not impossible, to say with confidence where the optic chiasm is. But I do know that it's connected to the optic nerves. I do know the optic nerves are here, so I can say it's, it's at least here. And for security, you could include one more slice superiorly, just if you want to be safe. We usually use the cross shape because we see that on MRI, and if you wanted to contour a perfect chiasm, you'd have to fuse an MRI image into this. And next, the pituitary gland. So sometimes we forget about this because we're not endocrinologists, but our patients and endocrinologists <laughs> that we work with really appreciate if we can, sp if we can spare the patient from suffering hypopituitarism. So I go to this last slice of air before getting into the cella turnica, this fossa here, 
and the pituitary sits in the bottom of this fossa. And zooming in close, you can see, can you convince yourself that there's something here compared to here? That's pituitary. Scrolling here. And great, and we are to the optic chiasm. Now, usually there's a pituitary stalk. It might be here. I'm not going to draw because it's already overlapping my chiasm. So now we are going to get to the cochlea. Where is the cochlea? Uh, so cochlea is Greek for snail. And if you've looked at pictures, a cochlea kind of looks like a snail. Now where is the snail in the skull? There are a lot of things that look kind of like circles, and I see lots of people trying to guess which of these circles is the cochlea. I will give you a hint. The only way you can see the cochlea is by using a bone window. So you have to change to a bone window when you're looking for the cochlea. And then cochlea is related to hearing, so it's actually going to be adjacent to our auditory canal. This is the auditory canal on the left, and this is the auditory canal on the right. Do not confuse it with the jugular foramen, which is lower down. Jugular foramen. So auditory canal is the highest canal we have. When we go higher, we don't see any more canal. So I've alluded that it's around the auditory canal. It is always this circle that's anterior. This is the cochlea. I scroll one up and I scroll one down. I feel pretty good about this coverage. Now I will say that I am contouring the anatomic cochlea. You may see others in practice that choose to contour a bit more generously and they may include a larger area around here. What else is around here? We'll see these circles here and here and here. These are semicircular canals and you can see them on the left as well. Circle, 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 semicircular canals. So if you want, you can count all of this as cochlea. You will sort of be more cautious that way, but it is acceptable to just contour the anatomic cochlea, and that is what we do. And while we're on the bone window, let's do the mandible. So I, I like to start my mandible on the bottom, and I also like to create a bone preset. This lets me contour quickly, without having to worry about being exact. The mandible is important to include because we want to reduce the risk of our patients suffering osteoradionecrosis in the long term after treatment. So do not forget to contour the mandible. Also, it's helpful to have this so you can actually perform Boolean operations later on if you want to subtract bone from your target structures in cases where there's no bony invasion. Now you may be wondering, what is this patient? This patient is actually a nasopharynx cancer case. They received induction chemotherapy and was initially staged as T3N1. So, we don't cover the teeth themselves, we only cover the root of the teeth. And you can see here that they are sort of surrounded by bone here. You can see this rim, this outline which represents bone harboring the root of the teeth. And then we're scrolling up, continuing to contour mandible. And we get to a part up here where the mandible sort of splits and two, an anterior part and a posterior part. The anterior part is a coronoid process, the crown process, and it still considers itself mandible. He wants to be included. So please don't forget to cover the coronoid process. He's an important part of the mandible. And I'm covering this posterior and this anterior part. Good. And here we no longer see the anterior part. And here we're getting into the TMJ joint space, the temporomandibular joint space. And the mandible's fitting in nicely here, and again, this part you can only really see on bone window. Another reason why I keep it on bone window when I'm contouring the mandible. 
and that was our last slice. So while I'm here, I switch to my temporal mandibular joint. I don't think there's a consensus for exactly how to draw this, but I like to include just a little bit of a margin around it, just like that, and I apply just a little bit of a cap. I'm imagining sort of this 3D spatial joint space. We'll look at the sagittal and coronal views to see if this makes sense. And how far down do you keep doing this? I keep going until the anterior and posterior connect. So right here is, is where I draw the last one. I'll interpolate. I'll go ahead and interpolate my mandible as well. And I'm going to fill all the holes in my mandible. And I will smooth it. The face bar is my hotkey for smooth. And now I'm going to do the same thing on the left side. So this is the slice where I divide. And this is where I start drawing my TMJ joint. And I just make a little perimeter around the mandible to include the joint space. There's no precise margin. You don't need to do some sort of fancy uniform expansion. You just want to make sure that more or less you are considerate of the space here. And again, I cover just a little bit of a cap. Let's interpolate that. Let's zoom in, kind of see what we have. So sagittal view, you can see that this mandible head is nested quite comfortably into this brown TMJ joint. And on the right, similarly, we have a very comfortable looking mandible resting in the TMJ joint space. Great. So we've done this. Need to change the presets back to none. Fill each slice like that. Great. And we are done with the bone window. We can go back to soft tissue window. And where are we now? We are ready to do some lips. So I look at the saddle of view to kind of get a sense, like realistically, where are the patient's lips? They're probably not down here by his chin. But here you can start to see how this tissue just looks a little different compared to this below it. It's subtle, but around here is where I would start to count this as lips. And lips don't have to be drawn perfectly. Mostly it's for helping choose the right angles that you'll enter and how much dose you'll give at each angle with IMRT planning. You carve out the air in front and you carve out the bone in back. And as you get closer to his smile, the lips are going to get wider. Actually, some even say that like the lips go back all the way to here. And seeing that, well, gosh, maybe I need to connect this back here. I've seen lots of heterogeneous lips. Like I said, this is not the most important structure to contour perfectly. But here you can make a pair of acceptable lips. And contour out the bone. Lips, lips, lips. And we are now on the upper lip. This case was easier to draw the lips because the patient had their mouth closed. But note that when the patient's mouth is open, I'm going to interpolate now. The lips may be divided here because the lips are not sealed. And so there will be a, a black space here where the lips are open. Okay, smooth the lips a little bit. And you can be neat to carve out some of the bone. And now let's do the oral cavity. So the oral cavity, I, th I think of it as a person has a big hairy tongue that we want to protect. And these black spots, are all kind of part of the tongue indicate kind of tongue tissue and I just think of like where does a hairy tongue start? It always starts at the bottom with something that's here kind of posterior and this is the beginning of the tongue. Now you may see in some contour guides and atlases that they say extend anteriorly all the way to the mandible and then laterally to the walls as well and that is a good way to be safe with the oral cavity, but just to demonstrate anatomically what is the oral cavity, get a sense of the shape. This is where it begins to extend forward and actually reach the mandible. And you can see this nice outline here, contouring all of this tongue. And in this way, at the end of the day, we're going to see a really nice looking oral cavity contour. 
when we look at our sagittal view. We can always already start seeing it forming shape. So here I'm being very particular about hugging the anterior aspect right behind the bones. And I'm looking at my sagittal view as I'm doing this, keeping in mind that the soft palate is part of the oropharynx, it's not part of the oral cavity. But if you look at recent OAR contouring guidelines by Brower in 2017, you'll see that they describe an oral cavity extended. And the oral cavity extended includes both this and the soft palate. So I think that is a fine way to do things. Reducing dose to the soft palate could help reduce the risk for a patient experiencing dysphagia or mucositis. And how high up do we bring the oral cavity? So you bring it all the way up to the roof of the mouth, like this. This is probably the last slice I see. If I scroll up any higher, I'm been to bone. So I'm gonna interpolate, and voila! I have a very smooth looking oral cavity from beginning to end. So this is what I was trying to achieve and show you. Now that since we are up here, let's do the pharyngeal constrictors. We have the superior constrictors, which start right beneath the base of skull, underneath the pterygoid plates. And in this case, the patient actually has a tumor. So my pharyngeal constrictor is not going to be accurate and superiorly. And you may not even draw a pharyngeal constrictor because all of this has to get treated anyways. But I will just show, imagining this patient didn't have a tumor, this is how I would draw the superior portion. Okay, we're starting to approach more normal area now that we're getting away from tumor. We're almost to the oropharynx. And here you can see nicely, once we get past the soft palate, there's part of it that likes to hug up around the edges a little bit. So a slight U. And this is a structure that you can interpolate, so it's okay to skip a couple slices. And it just goes straight down the midline. With the advent of IMRT and VMAT, it's now possible to help spare midline structures much more than we used to be able to. Some clinicians may not be in the habit of always including midline OARs, but in the modern era, these are good to include. And you can help your patients get through treatment a lot easier. So we're getting down to the lowest aspect of the pharyngeal constrictors. Some contour this as a cricopharyngeus. For simplicity, we just keep it as constrictors. And the question is, where does it become esophagus? So is this the first slice of esophagus? Actually, no, the first slice of esophagus starts where the, you really have a tube-like structure like this, nice and plump. And above this, see how this is less circular, this is more oblong. So I'd say this is the last slice of the pharyngeal constrictor. I will interpolate this and continue down to the esophagus. Contouring head and neck OARs is possible. And it's possible to do them all without taking several hours if you have a nice systematic competent approach and just flow from one to the next. So when contouring the esophagus, you might wonder, okay, first of all, this is so bendy. It is, is this esophagus or, or do I also count this? The answer is you count the bendy part. The esophagus is pretty squishy. And so this part here is actually esophagus. And the next question you might ask is, well, how far down do I take the esophagus? Do I take it all the way down to the diaphragm for a head and neck case? The answer is no. When we're evaluating our esophagus dose, one of the things we look at is the mean dose. 
And if we contoured a very, very long esophagus, essentially it would dilute the mean dose that we're giving. And so by including only the cervical esophagus, we're getting a more accurate representation of what the clinically relevant mean dose that it's receiving. So this will be more helpful for treatment planning and shaping your beams in a way that it's avoiding too much dose to the esophagus. So again, I bring it down about here to the where it's entered the thorax. Next, the epiglottis. This is a fun one to draw. So a little trick here is you can use a tissue preset and the epiglottis is this webby structure, and you can see it here on the sagittal view really nicely. If you see something kind of webby on both sides, you know you're at the epiglottis. And I'm using a tissue preset, so it's only applying the contour on soft tissue densities. And continuing this. As long as I see webbiness, it's epiglottis. And here I've finished the epiglottis and now scrolling up. And one trick is to see the full extent of the epiglottis, you have to switch to long window. And there, some hidden epiglottis. We've discovered the hidden epiglottis. Scroll up, no more. So I feel pretty good about this epiglottis, and I will smooth it. And we are ready to go back to soft tissue window, and where are we at? We are at the larynx. So where does the larynx start, and where does the larynx finish? And do you contour the bones when you do the larynx? So the larynx starts at the last place that you can see bone when you're scrolling up. So scrolling up, still seeing bone, stop seeing bone. So right here where I'm last seeing bone is where I'm going to start the larynx. And the larynx, you don't need to include the pharyngeal constrictor, but for simplicity I'm just going to include it like this. And you contour inside the bone. This is your soft tissue that you are worried about causing atrophy, scarring, and impaired mobility that can affect a person's phonation or ability to produce speech and sound. I like the larynx. It's a calm structure to draw. You have these nice sort of boundaries guiding you as you go down. And technically, you don't need to include the cricoid cartilage in the larynx. This is the cricoid cartilage, cricoid cartilage. But what's most important is that your last slice of the larynx is one slice below the last of the cricoid cartilage. So here, you see just a little bit more cricoid. So I'm gonna go one slice further down. This is gonna be my last slice of larynx. Good going to interpolate that baby. Let's scroll up and see how this looks. And going to make this a hard structure and cancel out the pharyngeal constrictors. So we have a nice larynx. While we're down here, we've now reached the thyroid gland. So the thyroid glands are bright on CT. They're pretty easy to draw. So I'm going to start with the most superior aspect I see, which is right here, the right lobe. Keeping an eye on the left side for when it starts. And there we see it. Start doing both now as we work our way down. Thyroid is a pretty easy structure to contour. So think of it as a break before we tackle the submandibular and parotid glands. 
So we're catching our breath here, just contouring the thyroid. It's nice and outlined for us. So usually you can feel very confident about your thyroid contours. And we will get to the point where we have the isthmus connecting the two lobes. And here it is. By the way, I'm using F on the keyboard as a hotkey for fill that helps me fill in gaps such as this. Pushing F filled the gap. And you want to make sure you carve out the air. Thyroid. Thyroid. And I've sort of forgotten what it was above, so I'm going to scroll back up. Okay, this is what it was. Scroll down. Okay, here's where it is. Very useful when contouring. When in doubt, scroll up, scroll it down. It's like looking both ways before you cross the street. Okay, great. And I will interpolate. And then here I can immediately see on the coronal view where I have some boo-boos. So this accidentally got covered as it performed the interpolation. This is good to see because this will happen. And it's your job to check your OARs before committing them. And quickly scanning at the coronal, I can see this here, which also points to me an area where I can provide a solution. See a little isthmus here. Great. Okay, zooming out, seeing how this thyroid is looking. Looks really nice. Now to submandibular gland. So we're almost there. How can you tell the submandibular gland from lymph nodes, from other things? So by the name, submandibular is going to be beneath the mandible, submandibular. And look at what you see here. So this is beginning beneath the mandible. This is also beginning beneath the mandible, but this is this is not a gland. This is a gland. Submandibular gland can be a little bit different depending on the patient. Sometimes it's just a little bit more forward than where these are located. But once you find it, and you may need to scroll up and down a couple times to convince yourself that you're actually on the submandibular gland, once you've found it, you really want to keep your concentration. Don't feel bad about looking back down to make sure you're still being consistent with yourself. You can scroll up a little bit at a time. I don't like to make big jumps when I do the submandibular gland. There can be vessels that, that go through it. That's okay. And then here I, I can see this. I'm going to scroll down to see, okay, so this was here. Maybe this is not submandibular gland. And now I'm going to scroll up. This looks obscured from some artifact. But I can sort of make out, based on where it was the last slice, it's probably like this. Scrolling down, back up up. And now we're starting to see just this last part here. I'm going to subtract the bone. And the very last bits of this gland. You may be tempted to stop here. And you're probably not completely wrong if you do that, but there's just a little bit more here that you can see. I'm going to interpolate. I'm going to make the mandible a hard structure, and I'm going to remove the hard structures from my submandibular gland. There we have it here. I'm going to smooth it once. I'm going to scroll through sagittal, make sure there aren't any gray regions that, that are clearly submandibular glands. This looks pretty good. So we're ready to go 
to the left side. And so if it, right away I know this is the left submandibular gland. And so I'm going to follow all the way down to the bottom and I'm going to start from the bottom. And you might be wondering, well, is this submandibular gland? I don't, I don't know. Scroll up and I'm like, well, maybe it's like this. But as you get up, you see, whoa, this is all part of the same thing. This is a really good example of where using the top slice to inform the lower slice and vice versa is helpful. So now I see that this was in fact part of the submandibular gland. I see this is part of the submandibular gland. It's just drooping down a little bit. And then this is also part of the submandibular gland. Think of it as an upside down mountain that had two peaks. That was the case in this patient, but the peaks were part of the same submandibular gland. You can notice this difference in density between here and here. That's how I can tell I'm still in submandibular gland. This is tricky and it does take practice. And here, it's going to hug the inside of the mandible. And then right here, I think I can see just a little bit more. There. How is that? I think that is pretty good. So let's interpolate. See how this looks. Smooth at once. Look at the sagittal to make sure everything looks pretty smooth. And I, I see this posterior of it's not covered, so I'm going to click here to see what this is. It's cueing me that maybe this is a portion that I missed, and sure enough, the sagittal view was helpful for me to see this part that was missing. Very subtle, but the sagittal and coronal views are your friend. And now that we're finished with the submandibular gland, we are ready for the parotid glands. I'm going to start with the left, and I'm going to find the bottom of the parotid gland. So this I know is parotid gland. You will get used to seeing it once you do many head and neck cases. And the parotid gland has a tail, which can extend anteriorly. And the parotid gland has a deep lobe, which is sometimes hard to see, but it, it goes all the way to the peripharyngeal space. Going to find the very bottom. In this case, it's right next to the submandibular gland. I don't always see that. There can be a lot of variation with the parotid gland and the biggest mistake that I see is missing the median lobe. You'll see the median lobe travels behind the submandibular gland and it's going to reach towards the North Star. And that North Star is the styloid process. Here's the North Star. And the deep lobe of the parotid has found its home. It's tucked in nicely behind the mandible. And you see I'm also getting the tail of the parotid up here. It's creeping up anteriorly. And it's okay, you want to cover that because that's part of parotid. Now, we talk so much about xerostomia in head and neck cases. The difference between salivary gland production of the parotid gland and the submandibular glands is the parotid gland is for stimulated saliva production. And what stimulates saliva production? Well, that's food. So when we eat or when we see food, the parotid gland is what's giving us that drool. Whereas the submandibular gland is helping produce saliva throughout the day. It keeps our mouth moist and at nighttime can help keep our mouth from getting dry. So very important to consider both glands. And I'm running out of room here. I can't really say I'm seeing convincing parotid gland above this. So I'm going to interpolate 
and see what I have. And that's a pretty smooth continuous parotid gland. And just scroll through sagittal views so you can kind of see. And then scroll through this coronal view so you can see. Great. So we've done the left parotid, now onto the right parotid, and this is our second to last OAR. Congratulations for making it this far. We are going to start at the bottom, where we see the beginning of the gland. I think that is right here, down, up, up, up. Oh, what's that? You want me to zoom in? Okay. Up. Going up. And we are finishing strong with a really good right parotid gland. And we know it's going to have a deep lobe, which is going to go behind the mandible. So the question is just when does the deep lobe happen? And sometimes you don't see the deep lobe. Sometimes it's, it's a little bit invisible to the eye, at least on CT scan. So you just have to trust that every parotid gland has a deep lobe. And there should be a part that's extending behind the mandible once you get high enough. So please don't forget the deep load of the parotid. And as we mentioned, the North Star styloid process, where it reaches in and it, and it touches it. Now I recommend checking out econtour.org for really nice atlases of lots of head and neck cases and other cases for other disease sites that you can look at and scroll up and down to get a sense of what perfect contours look like. But sometimes I find it helpful to just have someone walk you through it and show you exactly how they would do it and also talking about what's going through their mind as they're doing the contours. I hope this video helps a lot of you out there. I know you all are working very hard and if you're watching this video, it's proof that you're really dedicated to what you do and that you want to do a good job. So I commend you for your efforts and dedication. Sorry this video took a little longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> Guess that was false advertising. But the point is that you can do head and neck contouring without it needing to take all day, especially the OARs. And I'll just fill in one slice here. It's tempting to skip OARs because it is more work, but your patients are going to appreciate every single OAR that you draw because that's going to translate to less toxicity for them and better outcomes. And we see a very nice, smooth, right parotid. And last, kind of like wrapping the present, we are ready to do the skin. And let's celebrate the big old skin contour. This is a something called a whole body contour that you can do on your local treatment planning system. And then you just create an inner ring. You can do three millimeters, you can do five millimeters. It kind of depends on the institution. We do three and there we have the skin. Some key points. I used the TG263 nomenclature. That ensures that when I contour, it'll be consistent every time. And when I am later on wanting to do any research or studies, and I search my database and I want to know what was the mean dose that a left parotid gland got. So with the TG263, it'll save you a lot of time from having to go back and edit the names of structures if you ever want to do a research study. This way all of your patients in your study can have the exact same nomenclature. It'll be very easy for getting data. And then also you want to have a template that you use that's the same every time for each disease site, even if it includes additional OARs that you may not contour. In this case, my template also includes the left and right temporal lobes, which I didn't contour here because I don't always need to contour those. I may contour those especially in instances of re-radiation, nasopharynx cases in particular where the brain already got a lot of dose in that area. 
and the brachial plexus, which generally is safe with first courses of radiation, but in the setting of radiation, you want to be more careful, or in the setting where the tumor is very near the brachial plexus, you want to make sure that you protect it. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and good luck head and neck contouring.